Stanford University. We're going to get started. Uh, welcome back and Happy New Year, everyone. Um, I just have a few announcements uh, to make uh, before I introduce uh, today's uh, speaker. Uh, for the next Frontiers, it's going to be uh, Kieran Cush and uh, Jeff uh, Tudorberg, and who will talk about the heart uh, transplant failures. And then uh, let me see if this is operating. And then the one after that uh, is going to be Tim Nelson from uh, Mayo Clinic. And then uh, just remember to send in your CBI uh, travel award applications. And then um, April 22nd, 23rd, we have the Stanford Drug Discovery Symposium. It should be online right now. And I think if you look online, you'll be amazed at the lineup of uh, speakers uh, that we have for uh, this year's uh, uh, SDDS. Uh, and then the cardiovascular imaging T32, the uh, application uh, um, submit for the new position starting February 1st, and then greetings to our off-site uh, viewers um, in Hawaii, at the VA, and also at the Rosadero. And with that, it's a great pleasure to introduce a great friend of mine, uh, Mark uh, uh, Gladwin. Uh, by way of uh, our background, uh, Dr. Gladwin received uh, his uh, uh, medical degree at the University of Miami. Afterwards, uh, he did his internship residency at OHSU uh, in Oregon and then did a pulmonary fellowship at the University of Seattle, Washington, and um, did his uh, critical care medicine fellowship at the NIH. Uh, afterwards, uh, he did uh, a postdoc in cell and molecular biology uh, with the two uh, pioneers in the field, James Schellheimer and also Ellen Schechter. He then became the chief at the pulmonary at <coughs> NIH in around 2008. Uh, he was recruited to be the chief of uh, pulmonary at University of Pittsburgh, as well as the inaugural director of the uh, uh, Vascular uh, Medicine Institute. 2015, he became the uh, chairman of the uh, Department of Medicine, and he's really, in my opinion, one of the few chairmen of medicine who we would consider quadruple threat, you know, physician, scientist, administrator, and a mentor. Uh, and I'll explain to you why uh, he's such a great uh, physician scientist. Uh, Dr. Gladwin uh, is a member of the ASCII uh, and also the AAP. He's also received the NIH Director's Award, the NIH Clinical Center Director's Award, and the NIH Merit Award. Uh, he's made uh, similar contributions in the area of pulmonary vascular medicine, nitric oxide biology, vascular biology, among his uh, similar contributions, uh, he's widely known for uh, discovering that nitrite salt uh, is a biological signaling molecule uh, that has plays a, uh, important physiologic and pathologic uh, roles uh, in blood pressure, flow response, and mitochondria uh, uh, electronic uh, transport. Uh, he's, um, and I'm very amazed by this, uh, he's uh, had uh, 50 human subject studies, eight FDA INDs, and also four multi-center phase two, three uh, clinical trials. I think all of us would be happy with just one FDA uh, IND uh, trial. Uh, we're working on one right now, or but unhappy. it's really uh, amazing. Uh, I'm really amazed by, uh, by uh, his accomplishment. And on top of all that, he's been continuously funded. Currently he has one uh, PO1, two all ones, one training grant. And I could go on and on, but you know, it's just a, a great uh, pleasure for him to be here. Uh, for the uh, clinicians uh, in the room, you know, to have a physician scientist as a role model, and to ha uh, for the basic scientists in the room, to have somebody who does really top-notch uh, basic science research in vascular biology. Thank you so much, uh, Mark. For coming. Thank you. Paul. Can everybody hear me? Okay. I think there's a seat up here. Well, uh, as, as I mentioned yesterday in the PH seminar, I, uh, Joe left out that, that I was also trained at Stanford early in my career, and so I'm, I'm really proud to come back here. Uh, my mother uh, was a PhD student here in Ag Econ, so I was actually born at Stanford Hospital. <laughs> and my father, this is me when I had blonde hair, my father was an a PhD in anthropology with a minor in computer programming. He should have gone into computer programming. And we, had a, we then moved, uh, this is me in the middle in Escondido Village. So they used to tell me that I grew up in the student ghetto of Escondido Village. Um, and for all of you young people, you know, to make a career in science, you have to be ambitious. And you can see here that I outcompeted my local for the double popsicle. Um, <laughs> But then as part of my early training, my parents had to travel for their postdoc studies, their field work as anthropologists, to Africa. 
And so we went to Ghana where they were studying the, the fishmongers and their um, sort of the business of how they, they sold uh, uh, fish on the market. And this is my mother doing field work. And while they would work during the day, I, I would hang out with this guy who would take me from house to house um, eating the couscous if, if you're from Africa. And so I got a little bit of a, a, a belly there. And uh, this is just a few pictures from Ghana. So anyway, so I appreciate my early education from Stanford. And again, it's a real, real pleasure to come back here. So my, my career has really focused on two principles of redox vascular biology. And uh, at the center of this is sort of the conventional, uh, sort of the, the canonical nitric oxide signaling pathway where nitric oxide is produced by NO synthase in the endothelium. There's an oxidation of arginine to citrulline, and NO diffuses from endothelium to smooth muscle, and that's a paracrine signaling pathway. And we know now that hemoglobin is a very potent scavenger of nitric oxide. It reacts with and consumes NO. And the reason that NO can succeed as a paracrine signaling molecule and not be scavenged is because this hemoglobin is compartmentalized within the red blood cell. And the red blood cell creates major diffusional barriers for NO, like a cell-free zone, um, a, a uh, cell-free zone around the red cell, and an intrinsic diffusion barrier at the red cell membrane. Um, a lot of my work is focused on how hemolysis, and I talked about this yesterday, will disrupt these diffusional barriers and scavenge nitric oxide, and this can lead to problems in hemolytic diseases like sickle cell. It can lead to vascular endothelial dysfunction and vasculopathy. What I'd like to talk to you about today is another property of nitric oxide, that nitric oxide can be oxidized to form nitrite, NO2 minus the salt, and that this can then serve an endocrine function where NO can be carried farther to blood. It can then react with deoxygenated hemoglobin and other nitrite reductase in the mammalian vascular system to form NO and then promote endocrine NO signaling. So again, this is the canonical paracrine, paracrine NO signaling pathway that I mentioned, where again, NO diffuses, binds to its target, its heme target, guanylate cyclase, increases cyclic GMP and promotes relaxation. So when I started as a fellow early in my career, I became interested in the question, is there endocrine NO signaling? And despite all of the diffusional barriers for NO to go into a red cell that I mentioned, the half-life of nitric oxide in blood is still incredibly brief. The half-life of NO in human blood is about 0.2 milliseconds. And that's because the hemoglobin in the red cells still consume that NO. So if you breathe nitric oxide gas, which we use as a therapeutic, you don't see blood pressure drops because the NO goes into the bloodstream and it's scavenged by the red cell hemoglobin. However, when I started my career, there were some subtle findings that suggested that there might be an endocrine activity of inhaled NO. For example, in anesthetized sheep that breathe NO, there was an increase in glomerular filtration rate. And uh, there was this, this really seminal study that came out by Paul Cubes, who would later discover DNA nets. And what Paul Cubes was doing is he was studying ischemia reperfusion injury of the cat intestine. And he did this with and without NO gas uh, exposure. And what he showed in this study, and this was a, his JCI paper, in one of the studies, he gave L-name, which is a nitric oxide synthase inhibitor. And when you give L-name, you block NO synthase, and blood flow drops in the intestine, and you see this drop of about 10%. But if at the same time he was giving the cats inhaled NO, somehow blood flow was sustained. So it seemed like something was being carried in blood from the lung to the periphery and maintaining vasodilation. And he wrote in this paper, the notion that bloodborne molecules have NO carrying capacity is conceptually consistent with these observations. So we designed a study, and this is one of my first uh, INDs, uh, where we essentially working with Richard Cannon in the cardiovascular branch, we were able to take LNMMA, which is another competitive NOS inhibitor, and we put catheters in the brachial artery of normal human volunteers, and we infused this NOS inhibitor into the brachial artery so that it went into the forearm and inhibited NO production in the forearm. And when you do that, blood flow drops about 25%. So 25% of your resting blood flow is determined all the time by ENOS producing NO in your endothelium. 
And uh, then we had them exercise to create some hypoxic stress. And then we gave inhaled NO at 80 parts per million. And that was just the highest we could turn up the dial on the inovent, which was used for uh, neonatal pulmonary hypertension at the time. And then we repeated the NOS inhibition. And our primary hypothesis was, like that CUBES paper, if we could block regional NO production, maybe we would pick up a very small effect of inhaled NO on peripheral blood flow in humans. And this is what our data looked like. And you'll notice it looks very similar to the CUBES paper in cats. So during while breathing room air, when we infuse LNMA, blood flow drops almost 30%. This reflects the basal NO production that's being blocked. And when we gave inhaled NO, we saw a significant limitation of that effect. Something was replacing the nitric oxide that we were depleting. And we saw the same thing with vascular resistance. So that led us to the question, what's the endocrine species? Now at the time, people were very interested in the idea of s nitrosophiles So we looked at s nitrosohemoglobin s nitrosoalbumin And for bookkeeping, I always at the time measured nitrate and nitrite, which were inert oxidation products of NO metabolism in blood. And this is one of these studies where, in this case, we're looking at the consumption of these species across the forearm. So this is the Fick equation. We're measuring the arterial level, the venous level, and we're multiplying that delta times the forearm blood flow to get how many of these species are consuming from, consumed from artery to vein. And what we saw at rest with, with NOS inhibition and with exercise, we saw no significant consumption or change in consumption of NO bound to the this thiol of hemoglobin, s nitrosohemoglobin, no change in NO bound to the thiol of albumin. But we always saw consumption of nitrite from artery vein and a real increase in that consumption with exercise, suggesting that perhaps nitrite wasn't inert. Perhaps it was being metabolized during one half circulatory time from artery vein. Now, at this point, this was puzzling again because nitrite was thought by the NO field to be largely inert. Now, what is nitrite? Nitrite is, is a salt, NO2 minus. It's not, this is a, a, uh, a, a, an anion salt. Um, in, the, in your sigma bottle, it will be sodium nitrite. There's potassium nitrite. In solution, it has a pKa of about 3.3. If you drop below that pH, it will largely be nitrous acid in its protonated state. So we next asked the question, is nitrite an intrinsic dilator? When we published that paper with the AV gradients and suggested that nitrite could be consumed, that was very controversial at the time. Um, so we designed a similar study. In this case, we did the very same thing. We were going to exercise. We were going to infuse LNMA to block NO production. But then instead of giving inhaled NO, we were going to give intra-arterial nitrite. Now, we could get nitrite because it was present as an antidote for cyanide poisoning. So we got an IND to use the cyanide antidote nitrite, which is not FDA approved. It's just been FDA sort of condoned as an antidote uh, for 100 years. And we infused it. And to our surprise, nitrite was a very potent dilator at a concentration about 200 micromolar. So then what we did is we dropped our concentrations by two logs to the near physiologic level where we were infusing about 1 to 2 micromolar nitrite. And to our surprise, we saw vasodilation in 10 of 10 subjects at this low concentration. And you can see we saw dilation at rest. We saw dilation during NO synthase inhibition, so this is NOS independent. And we saw even more vasodilation during exercise stress. And again, the level coming out of the antecubital vein was about 2 micromolar. And we even saw dilation with exercise where that flow was higher at about 900 nanomolar, really at the near physiologic level. Initially, this was very controversial um, because in vitro, in an aortic ring bioassay, nitrite would dilate only above 200 micromolar to 1 millimolar concentration, whereas in vivo, we were seeing very potent vasodilation. Uh, but then this was rapidly reproduced by multiple groups in animal models and humans, and it's now become accepted that nitrite is a potent vasodilator in vivo. And we now, there's now a new paradigm in NO signaling uh, that two parallel systems really regulate nitrite or NO bioavailability in vivo. On the left, you have the arginine NO synthase dependent oxidation pathway to form NO. This requires arginine and a molecule of oxygen, and it's a five electron oxidation. 
This is obviously very important. This regulates our basal blood flow and basal vascular health. There's also a more primitive, highly conserved pathway that's reductive, NOS independent, and oxygen independent. And this is a conversion of nitrate, which is NO3 minus, to nitrite, which requires enzymatic reduction, and then nitrite reduction to nitric oxide. And again, this is reductive and oxygen independent and will be promoted under hypoxia. Now, one interesting feature is about the same time that we had published this nitrite work, there had been earlier work by the Lundberg group, um, the Weitzberg group, um, and Ben Benjamin's group, where they had been studying nitrate, NO3 minus, which is present in dietary foods like spinach and uh, beets. And it's a lot of the DASH diet, leafy green vegetables and fruits, contain high concentrations of nitrate. And bacteria have enzymes, nitrate reductase enzymes, and they convert nitrate to nitrite to NO as part of electron transfer reaction processes to generate energy. And bacteria have nitrate reductase enzymes, but mammals have largely lost those enzymes during evolution. But we have symbiotic bacteria in our mouths, and we actually use these mouth bacteria to convert dietary nitrate to nitrite. So what they described, and Dr. Aluwalia and other groups, is an enterosalivary circuit where people eat leafy green fruits and vegetables, and this is nitrate, NO3 minus. You eat it, that nitrate then is swallowed and is excreted in the urine. And that excretion, there's about a six hour half-life. And so here you see the nitrate with a nitrate load of beetroot juice, or in this case, they're actually giving nitrate. They're giving potassium nitrate. You see an increase to about 400 micromolar concentration that lasts 24 hours. And in blue is a control that didn't get the nitrate. Now, interestingly, that nitrate is then recirculated through the saliva. There's an enterosalivary circulation. And so some of that nitrate is retained to be swallowed again. And that nitrate then is converted to the mouth by these bacterial nitrate reductases in a very efficient process, about 20% of the mouth nitrate is converted to nitrite, which is swallowed. Now, they had been studying at the same time I was looking at nitrite, how that nitrite in the acidic stomach could be nitric oxide and would kill bacteria and improve gastric blood flow, part of the innate defense system in the stomach. But some of that nitrite is absorbed in the circulation. And you could measure after taking a beetroot juice or nitrate load, you see the nitrite in the plasma rise. And it can stay high up to 24 hours. And what we then showed was, of course, this nitrite could be con converted to nitric oxide. And in follow-up studies that they did, they could show that cyclic GMP in the plasma would increase and blood pressure would drop after this nitrate load. And interestingly, in other studies they showed is that if you spit, uh, instead of swallowing your saliva, you would blunt the increase in nitrite in blood, and you prevent the drop in blood pressure. So it really requires swallowing the saliva from the bacterial nitrite reductases. So this was really a very early microbiome study. And the, the strongest evidence that this pathway that I've described is physiologic comes from this very nice study from Dr. Owalia. And what they did is they took normal volunteers, they did blinded crossover design, and they gave them uh, beetroot juice, but they treated them with chlorhexidine to kill the bacteria in the mouth. And I'm sorry, this wasn't beetroot juice. This was just a normal diet. So this is normal physiology like you are right now, but with or without chlorhexidine to kill the bacteria in the mouth. And what they showed is that after you had mouthwash, there's a drop in the salivary nitrite, there's a drop in the urinary nitrite, and there's a drop in the plasma nitrite, and there's an increase in your blood pressure. And that this blood pressure change correlates with the plasma nitrite. So the normal diet that we're eating all the time, there's a conversion of the nitrate in our diet to nitrite, which forms NO and regulates some of our blood pressure. And what we know now is about half of the nitrite in our body comes from our diet, from nitrate, and the other half comes from the oxidation of NO from NO synthase. So the next question we asked was, how does nitrite dilate? And we noticed this observation in the humans, when we infused nitrite into the forearm, we measured 
the hemoglobin molecules coming out of the antecubital vein. So one half circulation, and we measured the NO bound to hemoglobin. So the heme of hemoglobin or the file of hemoglobin. And we saw this observation that at different oxygen tensions, so if we exercise, the oxygen tension dropped in the arm. And with LNMA, the oxygen tension dropped. So when we just correlated all of our measurements across oxygen tensions, we saw this relationship that there appeared to be more NO bound to the heme of hemoglobin in vivo during a nitrite infusion as oxygen tension dropped. So there seemed to be a relationship between the deoxygenation of hemoglobin, the infusion of nitrite in the arm, and the formation of nitric oxide bound to the hemoglobin. And so we, we did some research on this, and we discovered a work from 1981 from Michael Doyle. Later on, this, uh, we found a paper from 1937 by Brooks. And they described this nitrite reductase reaction, where nitrite reacts with deoxyhemoglobin and a proton. There's an oxidation, so a one electron transfer from the hemoglobin to nitrite. So you oxidize the hemoglobin to form met hemoglobin, and you make nitric oxide. So this is really an electron proton transfer reaction, which is classic for bacterial nitrite reductases. This NO then could react with and be scavenged by a vicinal deoxyhemoglobin to form NO heme right here, which we were measuring forming in blood. So this, this um, for us at the time, struck us as potentially physiologically important because you are, because it requires deoxyhemoglobin, there's hypoxic sensor properties. It requires a, protein, a proton, so there's metabolic sensor properties, and you make nitric oxide which is one of the most potent vasodilators known. So could this be a mechanism for hypoxic vasodilation or hypoxic uh, NO signaling? And uh, I'll just share one little piece of chemistry with you. The, the story ended up being a little more complicated. Uh, for the chemist in the room, if you look up here, this reaction is a second order reaction. The rate of NO formation is proportional to the rate constant times the nitrite concentration times the deoxyheme concentration. But what we found out, it took two years of work to figure this out, the rate constant is different for the R state of hemoglobin and the T state of hemoglobin. As you know, when hemoglobin deoxygenates, it goes from oxy or R state to deoxy or T state. And in that allosteric transition, the redox potential of the heme drops and the reactivity with nitrite increases. So what we actually see is a faster or a more reactive molecule when hemoglobin's oxygenated, but more hemes available to react with nitrite when the oxygen is released. And so the actual rate of nitric oxide formation peaks around the 50% hemoglobin saturation point, which would be ideal for oxygen sensing and hypoxic dilation. And this is shown on the right experimentally, where if we look at the rate of NO formation, there's a peak around the 50% saturation of hemoglobin. This process has been called R-state catalysis, where hemoglobin now is an allosterically regulated nitrite reductase with maximal NO generating or enzymatic activity at this R to T transition. Now, this has been hard to prove in that um, you can't really knock out hemoglobin. Um, what we see in all these studies in the chemistry has been reproduced that there, when you infuse nitrite, there's a correlation between drops in blood pressure and NO formation in the red cell. But how's that NO getting out of the red cell? And recently, there's been a number of studies that have evaluated this. And, and Alan Schechter, my prior mentor, has done a number of collaborative studies where they've looked at this nitrite reaction with deoxy red cells and NO signaling. And they've looked at platelet, the inhibition of platelet aggregation, which is a canonical NO signaling pathway. And in these studies, what they showed is you can take packed or you can take platelet-rich plasma, you can activate it, the platelets with thrombin, and there's an increased impedance in this case. Um, and then if you add nitrite, there's no effect on platelet, no inhibition of platelet activation. But if you have red cells and nitrite, you inhibit platelet activation. And this is really shown here. And they can inhibit this with PTIO, which is an NO scavenger. Again, showing that the re reaction of deoxy or red cells with nitrite inhibits platelet activation. And this is P-selectin expression, which is another way of looking at platelet activation. And here they showed that, again, deoxy red cells are even more potent convert uh, nitrite reductases 
uh, to make NO inhibit platelet activation. And they see this even at the physiologic level of 100 nanomolar nitrite. Um, and this is cyclic GMP in the platelets, again, showing that this interaction of nitrite red cells and deoxygenated red cells increases cyclic GMP. Again, further proving that NO can be exported from this reaction and inhibit platelet activation. We've also looked at this uh, with my collaborator, Danny Kim Shapiro, and this is just showing dose responses of nitrite and the inhibition of platelet activation with red cells and also pure deoxyhemoglobin. And with uh, a fellow, the, an endocrine fellow working with me uh, on her K grant, uh, she's recently published this study where we actually gave uh, normal volunteers a heavy isotope labeled nitrite, N15 nitrite. And when we give this, this is 20 milligrams of nitrite, we see this drop in blood pressure. But I just wanted to point out that we also see a significant inhibition of platelet activation in vivo. Um, and the Alawali group has shown this as well, that you can give volunteers either beetroot juice or you can give them nitrite and you'll inhibit the platelet activation in an NO-dependent pathway. And in this study, we are able to measure NO bound of the hemoglobin by EPR, electron paramagnetic resonance. And here you can see sort of the, the classic hyperfine splitting of a heavy 15 nitric oxide. So that's specific for the formation of NO in vivo and the inhibition of platelets. Recently, Paula Corti in my lab, she's done some really interesting look at, at one of the most primitive hemoglobins. So there's been recently this discovery of a globin called globin X. And we're very interested in this because it's considered to be one of the earliest ancestors of hemoglobin. And this is expressed in fish. And what's really interesting is she was able to show that this is expressed in the cytoplasm of red cells. So it's a red cell globin. Um, and globin X is really interesting because it's six coordinate. It has a histine on both sides of the heme pocket. So this is one of the first six coordinate globins to be shown to be in a red cell. And here uh, she would go to Woolies Fish Market, if any of you are from Pittsburgh, uh, every Sunday and she'd get a fish and they would uh, bleed the fish and give her the fish blood. So this is carp blood. Um, and it turns out you do not need an animal protocol if you, um, you're going to eat what you work with. <laughs> so she would get this fish, they called her the fish vampire, every Sunday, have a great fish meal and bring the blood in. And here you can see the staining for Globin X. Um, but what she was able to sow, the nice thing is we could culture these red cells because you can see they have nuclei and we could silence the Globin X. And so these are platelet studies where, again, we're showing these fish red cells. They are very potent with nitrite at inhibiting platelet activation and generating NO. And that effect can be completely blocked with silencing of the Globin X. So one major challenge in the field, and I, it's still a challenge, is how does NO get out of a red cell? Once NO forms, it reacts so fast with hemoglobin that how could any NO form escape the red cell? And uh, this is a challenge that people bring up all the time around this, this hypothesis. But I would just point out the same challenge exists for cardiomyocytes. Cardiomyocytes have 100 to 200 micromolar myoglobin. There should be no way that NO can exist in a cardiomyocyte. Yet we know if you knock out ENOS, you change cardiomyocyte function. So I think it's a greater challenge for the field. How is NO actually signaling in these heme-rich environments? The data to suggest that NO can escape from red cells comes from multiple studies showing that nitrite exposure to red cells generates NO gas, inhibits platelet activation, you know, all the sort of data I showed you. NO treated red cells vasodilate. We can add NO to red cells and then infuse them and they dilate. You know, we think it's nitrite dependent. Jonathan Stamler thinks it's snow hemoglobin dependent. Erythrocytes and nitrite release NO gas and can inhibit cytochrome C dependent mitochondrial respiration. ENOS knockouts. Um, if you do blood chimera studies and you knock out ENOS, uh, there is a hypertensive effect. The endothelium is more important for basal blood pressure control, but the red cell ENOS does also contribute to blood pressure control. Um, if you infuse red cells from ENOS knockouts, you'll have more cardiac injury in, in Langendorf models. Um, and there's been recently data just presented with uh, en erythrocyte-specific ENOS knockout that are hypertensive. So clearly NO is escaping from the red cell, and, and this has been a, uh, the subject of my research and others trying to understand how this can happen. And, and, you know, one of the interesting things about nitrite is it sits at this redox potential, where with one electron reduction it forms NO, with one electron oxidation it forms nitrogen dioxide, and NO and nitrogen dioxide both form dinitrogen trioxide, 
which has a longer half-life in a heme environment and is also a nitrosating species. So our group and others think that there may be nitrogen, dinitrogen trioxide accounting for this export. Um, and this, there's these reactions that can take nitrite or two nitrite molecules to N2O3 called anhydrase reactions. Um, and the other possibilities is that nitrosyl hemes are being exported through heme transporters, that RSNOs are being, or that cyclic GMP itself is exporting. And our group has spent a long time studying how N2O3 can form in the heme pocket, and I, I really won't go into that data, but just to point out, there's a lot of data on the formation of N2O3 as a secondary species or an intermediate in this possible export. And, and recently with Danny Kim Shapiro, we found some evidence for this idea and that we've looked at exposures to far red light um, using LEDs at 660 nanomolar, which will photolyze s nitrosothiols or iron nitrosyl, NO heme molecules. And if you expose red cells to nitrite and then you hit them with 660 nanometer light, you get a significant increase in NO release from red cells. And if you do these sort of platelet studies, again, where with no red cells, there's no effect of nitrite or far red light on platelet activation. But if you have red cells in nitrite, you can see there's an inhibition of platelets. It's greatly potentiated with light exposure. We can also look at blood flow in the rat. In this case, we've, we've, we've hit the, the, lat with, the rat with, with light um, in a gastroc. Uh, this is looking at oxygenated hemoglobin. And again, light, even without giving nitrite, the light increases blood flow. These are at, at different oxygen tensions. This is the lowest oxygen tension down here. But there's a significant potentiation with nitrite. Again, suggesting that intermediates are forming that have the potential to be more stable and to escape NO scavenging. So what about other globins? Um, the other way to test this theory is to look at other globins. Um, and it turns out that there's a common ancestor uh, of hemoglobin uh, diverged over time to form neuroglobin, which is present in the retina and brain, cytoglobin, which is present in all of our cells, including cardiomyocytes, myoglobin in skeletal muscle and cardiomyocytes, and hemoglobin. And so there have been a lot of studies. Shruti Shiva in my lab published the first paper showing that deoxymyoglobin is a nitrite reductase that can generate NO and inhibit mitochondrial respiration. Um, the Schroeder group using the myoglobin knockout mouse, they were able to show that the myoglobin knockout mouse had impaired uh, nitrite-dependent nitric oxide signaling. Um, and there's been a lot of studies looking at myoglobin in the regulation of nitrite reductase activity. And this study from the German group showed that at very low oxygen, myoglobin contributed to nitrite-dependent hypoxic vasodilation. There's also been studies looking at plant globins as nitrite reductases, which is really interesting because the plant is a very low oxygen tension environment with very high nitrite concentrations in the soil, and, there, that, and plants do not have enoses. So this is one of the pathways for NO generation in plants. And then lastly, we've looked at molecules like neuroglobin. Now, neuroglobin is really interesting because this is a redox sensor molecule. It has two thiols that are redox sensors. And the heme has two histidines in the heme pocket. And we were able to show that as you change the redox potential, you open up that heme pocket and increase the rate of nitrite reduction. And Jay's wire, I won't go into the details, but Jay's wire was able to show that cytoglobin in smooth muscle also had properties of a nitrite reductase. And adding nitrite could generate nitric oxide and generate cyclic GMP. So a theme is emerging with all of these globins that Hemoglobin and the globin family in general are oxidoreductase enzymes that can regulate oxygen and nitric oxide homeostasis. And the concept is that under deoxy conditions, they can convert nitrite to NO, but under oxygenated conditions, they can oxidize nitrite to, throw, to, to form nitrate. And cytoglobin, for example, may have a very important role as an NO dioxygenase regulating vascular NO levels. And these are the reactions. The NO dioxygenation reaction is the oxygen reaction with nitric oxide to make nitrate, which is an inactivation reaction. And then the nitrite reductase reaction is the reduction of nitrite to make nitric oxide. So just in the last four minutes, um, you know, I'm impressed that increasingly we are spending too much time on our smartphones. And every minute of the day, we're, we're um, on the phone looking at TV busy, and we, we don't really spend enough time thinking. 
And every summer, I go to, I take a little time off, and I go to Southern Oregon, um, where my wife's family has a place in the middle of nowhere. And uh, we go out there, and this is a picture from the front deck. This is kind of ranch areas. There's a little, uh, this is the Sycan River. This is the, a lake, but right beyond is this little Sycan River. And these are my boys. You know, the clothing's optional out there. Showers are optional. Not for the adults. Um, but anyway, one summer, uh, uh, Joe Beckman came to visit me. And Joe Beckman is at the Linus Pauling Institute. And he comes every summer, and he'll bring some salmon and some Pinot Noir. And he discovered peroxynitrite with Bruce Freeman. And we were sitting on the porch one day, and he said, he said, is there an antidote for carbon monoxide poisoning? Um, and, I, and I said, no. You know, there's, and I do critical cares in my clinical hat. And we had just had a tragic story. These are always tragic stories of a 17-year-old with his father. They were in a trailer home with a generator running. The power was out, and they were trying to fix, the jet, fix things. And they were working with their power tools. And the CO accumulated from the incomplete combustion of the generator. And they came in with uh, brain death. Um, they had a face ventricles. This is a, the CT. And so I started at this trip in Oregon. I was going for a daily run. And I started thinking, you know, my whole career I've worked on hemoglobin and ligands and nitric oxide binding to hemoglobin and nitrite reacting with hemoglobin. I should be able to figure this out, how to get carbon monoxide after hemoglobin. So I thought about adding oxidants like ferrous cyanide, but that would be too toxic. Could I compete it with nitrite or NO? And on the third day, I remembered some neuroglobin experiments that we had done. We were trying to understand how this neuroglobin reacted with nitrite. So we mutated this histidine here to a glutamine um, because I wanted to make a molecule that would be a hemoglobin-based oxygen carrier that could make nitric oxide. But it was a failed experiment because this molecule bound oxygen too tightly. It bound oxygen almost irreversibly. Um, and so I kind of had put that project on the back burner. But on this run, I thought, I wonder if it will bind CO. You know, most ligand binding affinities, you have oxygen affinity, then CO affinity is about 1,000 times higher, and then NO affinity is about another 10 to 100 times higher. So even though it bound oxygen tightly, it probably should bind CO more tightly. So we did laser flash photolysis experiments and CO off rate analysis of our mutant um, with and without CO. And we found that, indeed, this molecule bound CO about 600 times higher affinity than hemoglobin bound CO. So we had the hypothesis, could we engineer a heme-based molecule to bind CO with very high affinity and use this as an antidote, like a scavenger for CO poisoning? And the idea would be here your CO would bind to hemoglobin or cytochrome C oxidase of the mitochondrial electron transport chain. We could add this other neuroglobin molecule, and it would scavenge the CO. And as you know, there's about 50,000 cases of CO poisoning. 1% to 3% are lethal. 30% of survivors have neurocognitive injury. Um, and uh, it's, you get CO poisoning from either suicide attempts, leaving your car running, or people accidentally leaving their car running. A lot of people with these push-button cars are accidentally leaving uh, their cars running and getting poisoned, or that the furnace isn't working in the house, or fires. Fires is a major cause. Um, and so the way it poisons is it binds to hemoglobin, so it replaces oxygen. And it also increases the affinity of the hemoglobin, so it can't release the oxygen it's bound. And it also binds to cytochrome C oxidase, the electron transport chain, to in inhibit ATP production. The current therapy is 100% oxygen or hyperbaric oxygen. But the half-life of CO in our blood is 320 minutes with no treatment, 74 minutes with 100% oxygen, and 20 minutes in one of these dive chambers. So even with maximal therapy, the half-life is still 20 minutes. So anyway, so we, we incubated 100% CO-saturated red cells with our mutant neuroglobin. And we looked at the rate of clearance. And really, to our surprise, uh, this is 100% saturated hemoglobin, anaerobically or aerobically. And the CO cleared, you can see here, uh, within two minutes. And the half-life went in vitro from more than 500 minutes to 25 seconds. So then we looked at this in vivo, and we had a 100% uh, lethal, or a close to 100% lethal model, where we get very high concentration CO on, to mechanically ventilated mice. And then we infuse either albumin as a control or neuroglobin. 
And here you can see with the CO poisoning, the blood pressure goes away. And with our neuroglobin infusion, we, we sustain the blood pressure. And this is a Kaplan-Meier, 100% survival, zero. You see that with either albumin control or PBS control, almost all of them die, but they, they, they recover um, with the neuroglobin infu infusion. And we were able to show that this is the CO, the CO level with albumin or with, with uh, saline, and then with the neuroglobin, you rapidly decrease the CO hemoglobin level in the blood, and we can re reduce the lactate as a measure of anaerobic respiration. And so the concept is we can use this neuroglobin, we could infuse it into the vein, and it would have oxygen bound. The CO would replace the oxygen, kick off the oxygen, and scavenge uh, the CO from the body. And we're now looking at this as proof in principle. We're trying to develop this molecule, but at the same time, uh, we're also looking at other heme molecules, like cobalt, uh, corals, this MP11, as, and, and a variety of uh, peptide modifications to try to get smaller molecules that would be CO scavengers. So in conclusion, what I've talked to you about is that how we think about hemoglobin as an oxygen transfer molecule that's regulating oxygen gradients. But there's also a property as a oxidoreductase enzyme that is generating NO through nitrite reductase and consuming NO through NO oxidase activity as a rheostat of NO concentrations in the body. And I've also told you that these molecules can be used therapeutically to modulate CO binding gradients. And uh, with that, I'll thank you all, and I really appreciate the invitation and impressed with all the incredible science and the environment here. So thank you, Joe. So the, the molecule itself, we can stabilize, you know, either if it's deoxygenated and reduced, it can be stabilized as a solution. Once you infuse it, the half-life of the CO transfer in vivo to the molecule is similar to the in vitro. It's about a 25-second in vivo half-life of the CO leaving red cells or leaving mitochondria and binding to the neuroglobin. The neuroglobin-bound CO is then stable and it's a 16 kiloton protein, and we're seeing that it is filtered in the kidneys, and there's an in vivo clearance from blood of the molecule bound to CO with a half-life of about 13 minutes. So there's sort of two half-lives. There's the CO compartment shift to neuroglobin, and then there's the clearance to neuroglobin. And right now we're, we're looking at the kidney toxicity issues and trying to mitigate those of giving such a big protein load. Yeah, and our idea is, your, your first question is, our idea is that this would be a point of care therapy. That right now, people diagnose CO in the field. Um, there's, there's CO pulse ox and fire rescue trucks, and they know based on the environment, like your Oakland fire, presumably a lot of those people had CO poisoning. So you know when it's CO poisoning in the field, you test for it, and then the paramedics will send you to a center that has hyperbaric therapy. Um, but there's huge delays. So the idea would be the fire rescue would have the antidote and they'd give it right there in the field as an IV infusion. Uh, we've been making this in E. coli right now and we've actually been working with KBI based out of Colorado and it, it, we can express it in a, inclusion bodies so we can get very high expression in E. coli um, and we're working right now, we're sort of, um, in terms of your, your, your being here in Palo Alto, we're in uh, production hell like Elon Musk, but we're really struggling with the heme the refolding with the heme and the neuroglobin right now, but we can make it at very high concentrations and we're working on refolding with heme and trying to limit heme toxicity. Yeah, so endogenous neuroglobin is expressed at about one to 50 micromolar concentration in brain and endocrine tissue and retina. It's, and actually we don't really know what it's there for. It, it has, it is a redox sensor. It's highly conserved. It's got 25% sequence homology with myoglobin. It has nitrite reductase activity. It has NO diagenase activity, but we still aren't certain what it does. Um, and the knockout mouse kind of appears normal. So people are trying to, we're, we're, we're doing a lot of work trying to understand what these molecules do. But we're giving this now as a total therapeutic, as a recombinant protein in blood. Um, and 
but we haven't really looked for any interaction. We have done a lot of studies on mitochondria. CO poisons mitochondria. The CO binding affinity of cytochrome C oxidase is much lower than the binding affinity to hemoglobin. So actually our clearance from mitochondria is very dramatic. Whenever we infuse the neuroglobin, we immediately restore mitochondrial respiration. Stanford University.